Hey, it's Jordan with TYT, TYT Politics. I am here with Jared Beck. You uh, and your wife, I believe, have filed a lawsuit uh, a while ago uh, against the Democratic National Committee. Um, that lawsuit has been in court. Uh, you guys were in court yesterday. Um, for those that don't know, uh, just right off the bat, can you kind of explain what the lawsuit is, what your charges are, and what uh, relief you're seeking? Right. So this uh, lawsuit uh, is a case that we filed in uh, June of 2016 on behalf of uh, a number of named plaintiffs and proposed classes of uh, Bernie Sanders donors and also donors to the DNC and members of the Democratic Party uh, seeking relief on the basis that the DNC uh, failed to follow its own charter. Uh, in the conduct of uh, the democratic uh, primary process, uh, uh, the presidential nominating process. And we're seeking uh, relief in the form of uh, damages, uh, uh, essentially the return of those uh, donations that people paid to the Bernie Sanders campaign under the, uh, the belief and understanding that uh, this was a democratic, uh, free, uh, uh, and fair election process that they were participating in through their donations to the Bernie Sanders campaign. And you are looking for, I assume, the DNC would be, if you were victorious, the DNC would pay, be paying out uh, those donors. And I mean, how many, Bernie had hundreds of thousands of donors. So would that all of the donors? Right. Yes. Uh, the class is defined to include everybody who donated to the Bernie Sanders campaign. Um, as you know, he had a record setting uh, number of individual uh, donations. I believe it was around seven million. And um, according to the numbers that I've seen, we're talking about uh, two hundred twenty million dollars and upwards uh, in donations. So we're talking about a very significant damages calculation on a class wide basis. So could you kind of walk me through what happened yesterday? Um, you know, a judge heard uh, you and the defense, obviously, uh, from from things I've read, things I've heard, kind of seems like the DNC defense was, it's up to our, it's it's in our purview how, how we select a candidate and conduct things. Uh, what what was their defense and uh, what what was the judge's decision? Right. So this was a major hearing yesterday. Um, on the uh, defendant's motion to dismiss the case, essentially uh, throw the case out of court before it even gets off the ground. And they have a number of theories uh, as to why they think we should be thrown out of court, none of which we believe is meritorious. But yesterday, uh, the judge uh, heard oral argument on the motion to dismiss. And um, as I said, it was a very major and substantial hearing. It took an entire afternoon. Uh, the judge came prepared with numerous questions, very pointed questions for both uh, for both sides. Um, and extensive, substantial oral argument uh, was heard on the issues. Um, I would think personally, uh, some of the most significant things that came out of the hearing were things that the DNC's own lawyer said. Uh, number one, uh, the DNC uh, took the position in court through their counsel that uh, they have the ability to uh, choose uh, the nominee in any way they, they see fit, including, and this is their, to paraphrase their language, they could actually sit in a room uh, smoking cigars, just like in the old days. That's what their lawyer uh, said in court. And there would be no legal account of, uh, sitting in a room smoking cigars, picking the nominees, and not even have an election, basically. And there would be no illegal repercussions for that conduct. In wait, other wait, words, there would be no ability to... I want, yeah. to, I want to slow you down for a minute. You're telling sure. me, because I wasn't in the courtroom, so I just got to take what you're right. saying as, as gospel, that the lawyer right. for the DNC actually used the phrase, uh, we are free to do it like the old days of cigar back rooms, and yes. we could decide who the nominee is. That is exactly right. I mean, my mouth literally was dropping open as I was saying this, and uh, I couldn't believe 
what I was hearing, because basically he was saying we could do that. And he used the phrase just like in the old days. And we're, we're ordering the transcript of the hearing and we're going to make this all publicly available so people can see for themselves the exact language that was used. And, you know, not just at that moment, but the entire hearing. But um, yes, they said he said he used that phrase and he said we could do it just like in the old days and there would be no legal accountability. This is paraphrasing him, but that was the legal position that he took before the court. And, 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 and for the defense, what is their uh, rationale or defense in terms of by the DNC bylaws or charter, whatever it right. is, uh, they are supposed to be a neutral body when it comes to right. presidential primaries? Correct. And their position is that that means nothing from a legal accountability standard because they are taking the position that they are protected by the First Amendment as a political party in terms of their uh, what they do in terms of uh, selecting the, the, the presidential nominee uh, or, uh, for the Democratic Party. And so uh, that essentially means what they're saying is because we have free speech rights, because we have freedom of associational rights, all the stuff in the charter, everything that was said in public by Debbie Wasserman Schultz and the other DNC officials about how we're being you know, fair and even handed when, of course, we all know what they were doing behind the scenes. All that doesn't matter because of the First Amendment. That's what they're saying. Well, it would seem to me, uh, not from a political point of view, but just like a common sense point of view, if in your bylaws, which, again, the term is law, <laughs> uh, right. you say you're, you're a neutral body, free speech wouldn't apply right. because you're basically saying you are choosing not to speak and not to, right. not to take a stance or an opinion. So those right. two things seem to conflate with one another. I agree with you. And I think the judge uh, was very skeptical of their position at well, as well. He was very familiar with what the charter said. He kept uh, invoking it uh, at several points throughout the hearing. And again, this is all going to be in the transcript uh, so people can see for themselves. But he invoked that very provision of the charter to the DNC. He asked them some very uncomfortable questions. Um, and he uh, and, you know, I think it even goes beyond the charter, quite frankly, because uh, we it, it, this is fundamental to democracy. I mean, the Constitution speaks of a democratic political system. And I kept bringing this point over and over again, which is that in order to have a democracy, the DNC has to be even handed and impartial in the process or else we don't have a democracy in this country. And I think the judge. Um, I personally think the judge saw that point very clearly. I think he was uh, very disturbed by the position that the DNC uh, took. I know I was completely um, dumbfounded that that was the position that they took in court, which is that, again, no legal accountability uh, for, for any way that the DNC chooses to pick a nominee, including, as their own counsel said, we could just go back and smoke the cigars, sit in the room, and pick them between, you know, the party elites and not even have elections. And that would be perfectly OK from a legal accountability perspective. And uh, what did the judge ultimately decide? Is, is he now has he did not make a decision and is continuing to weigh the case? Well, um, let me um, if he hasn't formally made a ruling. He didn't issue rule from the bench. He's working on the written order. And um, he uh, at the end of the hearing, um, he indicated that that's going to take some time because there are a number of issues that uh, need to be uh, set forth in the order itself. It's not just going to be a decision. It's going to contain uh, all of the legal reasoning underpinning the decision. But there was something very, very interesting that he said at the end of the hearing. And um, I I'm, have my notes here because I want to make sure I paraphrase him as accurately as possible. This is what he said at the end of the hearing. Judge Locke said, Democracy demands the truth so that people can make informed decisions. Well, that's uh, he's right. Um, so is there a did he give a timetable? You know, sometimes a judge will kick the can down the road and schedule another hearing for two weeks from now. 
No, I don't think he's going to kick the can down the road. I think he's going to be diligently working on an order over the next several weeks. He has, you know, he has a team of law clerks that um, assist him uh, with research and drafting. So I'm sure they're very busy uh, working on that. He had a very, very detailed, pointed list of questions, and uh, you know, I don't want to speculate on what. Uh, the decision is going to be one way or another, but I, I will say that I got the distinct sense from this hearing that this judge is determined and wants to have a trial on the issues uh, that are raised in our complaint, and that I believe in my heart that we're going to get a trial in this court. And maybe I'm asking because I would just personally love to cover this, but are you like, is this the type of case where you'll be calling like Debbie Wasserman Schultz to the sand or Donna Brazil? Like, how, how is this yes, working? Absolutely. Absolutely. And the, the, we're going to be, um, you know, if this case does indeed move forward, the next step is discovery. So before trial, we're going to be going through an extensive discovery process and putting them under oath at deposition. And we're going to be asking them all of the relevant questions that deal with the allegations in the suit, and they're going to have to answer those questions under oath, under penalty of perjury. So, Jared, let me ask you, just, I think you know what I believe, and I'm pretty much with you, but devil's advocate, you have a lot of more, you know, establishment Democrats who say, you know, yeah, maybe it was tilted a little bit, but Hillary Clinton won by three million votes. Like, it's not like the machines were hacked, which is a whole different story. Right whole different discussion. And, you know, enough of the sour grapes. We need to unite. What, what do you say? Mm -hmm. to, what do you say to more? Uh, I would call them the status quo Sam's of the world. Yeah. Uh, that well, they, what, basically yeah. say there's no proof that any rigging went on. Well, that's a really interesting question, Jordan. And it, it gets into another thing that the DNC said at this hearing that absolutely, uh, I, you know, my mouth was, you know, if it didn't visibly drop open, I definitely felt like it should be dropping open. And I don't think I was alone in the court when this happened. But the DNC's lawyer said, again, this is at the hearing yesterday, he said he took the position in court as an officer of the court that he, it is the DNC's position that impartial and even handed those terms that are used in the charter don't have a sufficient uh, enough meaning to actually um, allow uh, the court to adjudicate the claims that we brought. In other words, they're, they're, they don't really mean anything. This kind of sounds like this kind of sounds like Bill Clinton. What did he say back in the day? Like it, dep right. it depends <laughs> on the definition of is, or I don't even know what he said. Right. Right. Yeah. So yes, it, it depends on what you know what is means in that sentence. Uh, this is exactly what's going on, and it's here's the here's what's really uh, insane about that from my perspective is that he is talking to a federal judge when he is saying that the words impartial and even-handed mean nothing, and this is a federal judge who, like every other federal judge, has a duty and in fact does act impartially and even-handed on a daily basis because that's what judges do. So in my view, this isn't just wordsmithing. This is an attack on the very concept of what it means to be impartial and even handed, which is the entire underpinning of our judicial system. So I don't think personally that though that position went over well at all uh, yesterday. Um, I don't agree with it. I think it's very clear what impartial and even handed mean. It's common sense. Mm -hmm. You don't devote any resources to one candidate over another. Um, you don't make hiring decisions based on one can what one candidate wants. You don't have create na narratives in the media that harm one candidate at the expense of another. Um, you don't uh, pick sides in disputes when there are disputes between the candidates, like what happened in Nevada with the chair throwing incident. And we can go on and on and on. And I went through the entire list. And again, it's all going to be in the transcript of what we believe we um, uh, are examples of not acting impartial and even handed. And all this will come out at trial and a jury is ultimately going to make the decision. But I don't think um, you know, even, you know, in, you know, to, 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 uh, to respond to your devil's advocate, um, question, I just don't think they have much of a defense at all. If that's where they're going to go trying to defend this case. Right. And feel free to, you know, include me in your case, uh, having broken the Donna Brazil story just for my own ego. 
uh, Leslie, <laughs> Le- <laughs> Le- Leslie, uh, you know, people might wonder, wow, this guy is very passionate. Like what, tell me about yourself. What made you want to even like spearhead this, this lawsuit? Um, obviously you, I'm assuming you were a passionate, uh, Bernie Sanders supporter. Absolutely. This is what, this lawsuit is one of the, uh, many flames that are, have been stoked by Bernie Sanders going on throughout the country right now. And, you know, I think this is just a small part of something much larger that's going on in terms of a broader movement. Um, you know, for me personally and, and my wife, Elizabeth, who's also my law partner, uh, we were indeed very passionate about Bernie Sanders. We formed our own, we call it our own little super PAC with some of our savings. Um, and we did so um uh, you know, during um, uh, uh, the Bernie Sanders um, uh, campaign, just as a way of um, getting involved, you know, the whole purpose of our our our, or his, uh, our super PAC, it's called Jam Pack, was to make you know little videos that advanced Bernie's message. You know, this was at a time when you know people were uh, saying that Bernie couldn't uh, connect with Latinos, for example. So we went out and had a, a few videos made that you know uh, were you know Latino Bernie Sanders supporters explaining you know why they supported Bernie Sanders, that type of thing. So that's how we got involved with Bernie Sanders, but um, I can tell you that this case, um, the seeds of this case were planted um, when a gentleman by the name of uh, Nico House, who um, uh, I think a number of your viewers may be familiar with, but he was a, a grassroots uh, organizer in North Carolina, uh, head of the uh, 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 University of North Carolina students for Bernie Sanders, I believe, and he came into our office I want to say it was in February of uh, 2016 um, with um, what he believed at the time was very disturbing evidence of um, exactly what we're talking about in this case. Um, You know, the DNC um, favoring um, the the Hillary Clinton campaign and in, um, you know, the evidence that he brought to us involved infiltration of uh, the uh, North Carolina uh, Bernie Sanders campaign by Hillary Clinton loyalists. And so that was, you know, the first uh, time this issue was brought to my attention. You know, as a lawyer, you know, I thoroughly investigate, um, you know, it's our, it's our practice to thoroughly investigate um, claims when they're brought to us and circumstances. You know, obviously we were involved um, in the Bernie uh, Sanders campaign as very active, fervent supporters, but then the, the real bomb dropped that uh, allowed us to file this case in uh, June of 2016 when the Guccifer, uh 2.0 leaks came out because, you know, you can't file, you have to have evidence before you come into court and file a lawsuit. That's, you know, the principle of, um, you know, that applies. And so, you know, you know, we had, you know, you know, Miss, Mr. House had brought us, you know, some disturbing facts and they certainly led to some, um, you know, um, really disturbing ideas about how the DNC was conducting itself. But when Gucci for 2.0 uh, uh, dropped those documents in, in June, and again, this is before the convention, and suddenly internal DNC documents were coming out into the public domain, which showed the genesis of this very strategy that uh, Nico had seen implemented on the ground in uh, North Carolina, uh, or in North Carolina, and it also confirmed everything that we were starting to see in this media blackout and media mainstream media bias against uh, uh, the Sanders campaign. You know, it all started to come together, and we realized that we had, um, you know, a case, and we felt obligated to file it. And we, you know, we've had so many people contact us, and so many people want to get involved, and so many people uh, sign up to be. Um, class representatives. I mean, it's been overwhelming. Great. Well, I will definitely stay in touch with you uh, as this progresses. Um, Yeah, I I think it's a really interesting thing. A lot of the things you're telling me that were said in the courtroom, uh, you would think they would only say it out loud in a cigar filled back room, but they actually said it to a judge. So obviously uh, the the arrogance and tone deafness of, of the DNC politicians apparently extend to their lawyers. So yeah. Uh, thanks again, and uh, we'll keep in mm-hmm. touch with you.